Dominic Steele here for The Pastor's Heart, and it's great that you could join us this afternoon. Now, coming up over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be having Ed Shaw in from livingout.org, talking about uh, pastoral ministry and same-sex attraction. Also, we're going to be talking to Jenny Brown from the Family Systems Institute, and uh, the whole subject of uh, resilience and family systems theory in Christian ministry. Philip Jensen is going to join us. Uh, Mark Thompson, the uh, principal of Moore Theological College. He's been on a tour of theological colleges around the world and what he's learned about theological education uh, from that uh, from that kind of whistle-stop tour that he's just done. And Lionel Windsor will be joining us to talk about Is God Green over the next couple of weeks on the uh, Pastor's Heart, and we hope you'll stay with us for that. If you could help us get the word out, we'd appreciate that. Uh, if you could like us on Facebook, if you could rate us on the iTunes store, if you could subscribe to us on YouTube, but tell your friends. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who I was sure would know about our podcast, but he didn't. And so if you could let your friends know that'd be a blessing to them uh, as we go forward. Our guest today is uh, Stuart Crawshaw. Stuart, thanks for joining us. Stuart, of course, is Senior Minister, Soul Revival Church in the Sutherland Shire, and I think you know more about uh, youth ministry than any of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, and doing a PhD uh, on this whole topic, and we'll explore and get a couple of questions about that as we go on. Stuart, let's start with your heart. And um, uh, what's a journey where you thought, oh, what is God doing? <laughs> and, and he's worked on you in that area. Yeah, yeah I, th I think a, a big journey for me in my life was when I was uh, finishing high school myself. I was uh, attending a youth group at Gomer Anglican Church, which was terrific. And I had a lot of friends that used to go to that youth group. And we'd go to youth group on Friday night. And then we'd also go to church together to the evening youth service. And um, we spent most of the 80s um, in that sort of world, I suppose. And when uh, I was growing up in that world, I, I didn't really expect that it had ever changed much. But then at the end of the 80s, early 90s, all of my friends ended up moving on. So some of my friends uh, went on to other churches and stayed Christian. But a lot of the young people in my youth group uh, from growing up in my youth group days actually just uh, stopped going to church altogether. So that was a really difficult time for me to work out what was I going to do. Uh, I was really thinking uh, one night at church when I realised I was the last one to be coming to church. I was thinking about maybe going and visiting some other churches to find some people my age. But then as I was standing in the church thinking about that, I looked over to my right and I saw that there was a bunch of young people just a little bit younger than me. And the thought occurred to me, I wonder what's going to happen to them. And then I thought something different. I thought I might stick around a bit and see if I can be of help to them to see if I can be encouraging them to uh, uh, maybe get involved with uh, discipling them uh, so that they might be able to uh, stay coming to church and stay Christian. So that was a really big time for me because it ended up shaping the future of my life yeah. because I ended up deciding to commit to my local church and to dig in there with those young people for quite a long time. And that suburb, that area of Sydney mm. has been your life for, well, yeah. It was your life up till then, mm. and it's continued to be, be, your, be your life 25, 30 years yeah, later. 25, 30 years, yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the value of that, of the long term, and, mm. and calling on others? Because it's not just that you've done the long term, mm. you've called on others to, to be committed long term. Mm. Well, I remember actually talking to Dudley Ford in the 90s, just not long after I made that uh, decision actually and Dudley said that in as his as a generation grown up who is Dudley Ford <laughs> <laughs> he was an elder of the Anglican church that was um, very supportive and encouraging of us in our early yeah, years a great and, godly man yeah, yeah. and he was um, uh, amongst the many things that he'd done in ministry he was also the senior minister for St Ives for many years yeah and he um, anyway he 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 was very encouraging to us and one thing that he said to me was that uh, as he looks around Sydney, he can see that we're quite a transient population. Yeah. So Sydney siders uh, in the part of the world where we live move house quite regularly. And even back in the 90s, he thought it was as often as once every five years. Yeah. And his uh, uh, impression was that when people move house, they move church as well. Yeah. And so Christians were moving around quite regularly from different churches. And he thought one of the consequences of that was that uh, people were becoming more individualistic and more consumeristic and more transient as Christians. And so those three problems were, uh, I suppose, in front of mind when I decided to, to stick around at Gaimi. 
And how have you gone at calling people mm. to do it with you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, because 25 years is enough time to ask, did that call work? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. Well, because our youth group had pretty much um, changed so dramatically and shrunk quite a bit in a short amount of time, uh, I had an opportunity at the time to study at the University of New South Wales uh, to do a PhD in political science. And so when I started that PhD, we got to uh, think as a small group of youth leaders about are there any other ways of doing youth group? And so the youth group we were part of uh, was a Friday night youth group that had a talk and uh, some games and then some cordial and biscuits or chips at the end of the night and then everybody went home. Um, there was a youth service as well. And when, as, as, as I was doing some research, I thought I'd look into the history of youth ministry a bit yep. more. And I, I realised that that wasn't always the way young people were brought up in the church. So we, yeah, through that research, we had a bit of into that history. Yeah. yeah, okay. So... Uh, modern youth ministry as we know it goes back to the Industrial Revolution. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, 75% of people lived in villages. And when they lived in a village, the parish church in England, where the Industrial Revolution started, the parish church was the centre of people's lives. So mm -hmm. there was a constant there. So before the Industrial Revolution, people were born, they grew up and they died in the same place. So passing on values in that context was quite an easy thing to yeah. do, particularly at a time where that generation saw their individual identity so tied to their communal identity. Yeah. Now what happens with the invention of steam is that steam driven tractors can harvest the crops a lot quicker than a hundred people. And so all the jobs dry up in the countryside and at the same time these same machines, the same steam engines, start mass production and mass manufacturing in the cities. And so as a result there's a mass migration from the villages to the cities. And the Industrial Revolution is still going. So that is still going on all over the world. Where, yeah. Wherever the industrialisation takes place, there's, there's this migration. Now, in early, uh, in, well, it was actually at the end of the 1700s, uh, mass migration from villages to cities. And in these cities, there were slums that, you know, formed around the factory. So now the factory was the centre of people's life, not the church. village church and there weren't enough churches in these new cities for this massive population expansion so the institutionalized church had a lot of difficulty working out how we're we going to pass on our values our christian values to the next generation particularly when there were so many uh, children working in factories a lot of homelessness there was a lot of social uh, problems and it actually was um, so difficult that the institutionalized church didn't have a solution However, a concerned lay person by the name of Robert Rakes, uh, Robert Rakes lived in Colchester, I think I pronounced that city right, and he had an idea. He thought, what if I just ask these kids who are roaming the streets to come to my place and I'll teach them the Bible? And so he started the world's first modern youth ministry, which was called the Sunday School. Now, that was so successful in that city that his newspaper that he ended up writing replicated that approach. Uh, really quite easily with the principles that needed to be put in place to look after the kids and to teach them the Bible yep. in the Sunday school. Uh, that spread around the world really quickly. And what we see within 50 years is that the Sunday school movement is the, the biggest youth movement in the world. But interestingly, it started as a grassroots movement and then institutionalised to become a big organisation. They needed treasurers and you know yep. presidents and all those sorts of things. So there's a man by the name of Mark Center III who wrote a very seminal book in uh, 1991 that charted that life cycle of that Sunday school. And then what he did with that was he looked at all subsequent youth ministries that came about after the Sunday school and noticed that all of them started at a time of dramatic cultural change, started by a grassroots layperson working with young people on the ground, that successful model would then institutionalise and the rest of the church would be able to copy it when yep. it became an institution. So what we've seen over the last 400 years... Is a series 200 of years, these. Yeah. yeah, a series of these. So a series of cycles. So over the last 200 years, uh, he, he argues there's been four cycles of youth ministry that have followed that trajectory. So when I was studying that back in the uh, early 90s, I thought of talking to our, our small youth leadership team. It was um, my wife, Louise, and then two other uh, young adults that were leading the group together. And I said, well, 
we'll never do anything as grand as a Sunday school. Yeah. But why don't we take that principle and actually try and experiment in the context of the local church? And so we, we did an experiment we called Soul Revival. And the tweak that we gave youth ministry was that we thought because relationships needed strengthening in our context, we'd continue to teach the Bible and gather around the Word of God, but we'd also strengthen the relational context for discipleship and mission in the youth ministry. So the way we decided to do that was instead of seeing youth group as an event, we decided that as a group of youth leaders, we would be friends for the gospel. And after all, Jesus said, I no longer call you my servants, I call you my friends, if you do what I say, mm -hmm. which is to love one another. So we thought if we became a group of friends as youth leaders and we met on Saturday night as a group of friends, we'd gather around the word of God, we'd ask our non-Christian friends to come, our Christian friends to come. But importantly, what we were doing was creating a space that the young people could grow up into. And so that's what we started in the early 90s. And God was very kind to us and very generous to us. And over the period of seven years of taking that new approach, we not only started to see that problem of individualism, consumerism and transience decline, we saw it replaced by a group of Christian young people who were more corporate in their thinking. Yeah. They were more servant hearted in their thinking and they were also uh, more stable. So the group grew from four to about 500 young people in seven years in the 90s. Right. Now, I've heard you talk using the labels incarnational mm -hmm. youth ministry and atonement youth ministry. Mm -hmm. When people talk about those two different terms, mm -hmm. what do they mean? Yeah, that, I like to think of those two theological terms as uh, people use those terms um, as like a theological driver for their ministry. Yep. So much that is written in youth ministry comes from what we call an incarnational perspective. Now, obviously the incarnation was when God became a man, yep. and so Jesus came and he was born as a Jew and lived amongst the Jews. So as he became a Jew to the Jews, the incarnational driver for youth ministry takes that as a model and says, well, as Jesus became a Jew to the Jews, why don't we be surfers to the surfers? Hip hops to the hip hops. Yeah, if there's a hip hop community that we want to reach into, we need to actually cross that cultural divide and actually start walking in their world first. And some even say, go as far as to say that we also need to earn the right to be heard. So that we need to make relationships with these people in their context. Uh, so one of the uh, key things... So if I want to reach the surfing community, I've got to become a really good surfboard rider. Yeah, yeah. I've got no hope. <laughs> well, you, you might have hope. <laughs> I'm not that good a surfer, but yeah. <laughs> That's the idea. So the strategy, I mean, it's, it makes sense. It's pragmatic. Yeah. And it's, you know, if I want to reach out to a group of punks and I'm not dressed like them and I don't talk yeah. like them and I don't listen to their music, then back in the you know early 90s when I started, you know, the punk scene was re-emerging. You know, that culture was is so idea. fluid. How can I possibly yeah. keep up with... Yeah. Well, well, that's one of the problems with the incarnational approach, I think. It's under great strain in an increasingly pluralistic culture that we live in. Yeah. Because not only do we have a generation gap in our culture now where young people and older people don't listen to the same music, don't have the yeah. same kind of values now, but also if you look within a generation, say with young people, there's intergeneration gaps yep. that are actually meaning that surfers don't talk to Doctor Who fans and yeah. and computer fans. So there's all these different tribes. So if we're going to try and be incarnational in our youth ministry and try and create a culturally relevant ministry for each of these different groups, we're going to struggle. Yeah. Alternatives? Well, uh, I feel like even in the early 90s that was under, beginning to be under strain. And so I mean, what we... I guess it's going to be easier the more homogenous youth culture is. Yes. Um, but as we've we've seen, the massive breakdown. I mean, mm. that that tribalism or breaking mm. and fragmented tribes mm. is much more to the case than it was 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah, because not only do we have intergeneration gaps, we have intra-generation gaps, gaps now. Yeah. So, you know, somebody who's There's not just one 19, pop music station for... No, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And someone who's 19 is is not going to talk to someone who's still in high school yeah. very often as a friend. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we have these we have this problem in our culture where we embrace sameness rather so, than difference. So I interrupted you. What's the solution? No, that's all right. No, that's all right. <laughs> so I think I think one of the exciting things about having a driver that comes from the atonement is that uh, what we what we see with the atonement of Christ when he died on the cross and rose from the dead, he deals with sin and it's the climax of the biblical story. So with our biblical theology, we we look at everything in the Old Testament is pointing to 
Christ's work on the cross. And when he dies and he rises from the dead, we see that in the New Testament, everything's looking back to that event and thinking, how does that reshape our life? And also looking forward to the new eternity where we get to, to enjoy eternity with God. So I've been thinking about youth ministry from an atonement perspective um, since the 90s. And that's been really helpful for me in thinking through how we can have a theological driver that actually doesn't focus us on being culturally relevant, but actually focuses us on what is our identity as the children of God and how do we be Christian in the culture that we find ourselves in and how do we not just embrace sameness of trying to be culturally relevant to people who are like us, but it, it actually means we, you know, using this paradigm that we can actually be embracing difference and loving others who are different to ourselves. Um, the other thing I found really helpful is uh, when you think of Romans, for example, uh, Paul takes 11 chapters to explain the gospel. And then in Romans 12, he then says, so how do we then live? And as he begins to unpack how the gospel makes a difference to our lives, he has that beautiful statement in chapter 12, verse 1, where he says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And I think the, the, the most beautiful act of love that anyone has ever done is Jesus dying for us mm -hmm. on the cross and, and serving us in that way. So when we think about that uh, as a young leadership team in the early 90s, we were actually thinking, as Jesus says in Matthew 22, 37 to 40, love God and love others. We were thinking, why don't we um, partner with Jesus as he reaches the lost and actually learn from him how to love? And so putting that uh, before actually questions like how do we then communicate the gospel to different cultures and, and, and be culturally relevant, the first thing we could do is express that relationship we have with Jesus and each other. So our youth leaders would hang out on a Saturday night as friends and that was a time where we'd read the Bible together but also talk about what that looked like in our life and also had a lot of fun together as well. Mm. So that, that's how we did that. Mm. Okay. So... Uh Youth ministry, you, you're now actually pastoring a church of six campuses. Or six, six gatherings. Six yeah. gatherings, okay. Mm. What does that look like? Yeah. <laughs> well, we began Soul Revival Church in 2012 when Bishop Peter Haywood and ENC invited us to plant a church. Yeah. And we planted in Kirawee. And what we thought we'd do is use what we call a shock absorber. Idea. Now this term shock absorber, I've heard you use that before. Can you just define it for Yeah, us? I could briefly take you through that. If you think of a car travelling along a road and the car's driving along the road, when it hits a bump in the road, yep. it uses or relies on its shock absorbers to yep. absorb the shock, right? So the way I see the car is the car's like the church moving through time and the shock absorbers is youth ministry. And the shocks in the road, the rocks in the road that the car has to travel over are like cultural changes. Mm -hmm. So the, the shock of a cultural change is absorbed by the youth ministry in the, in the car as the car travels over the top of it. For example, like we said, the Sunday school movement was like a shock absorber for the church that helped the church to adjust to the Industrial Revolution. Okay. What have been the big bumps in the road mm -hmm. in the last 15 years? I if think, you had to name yeah. a couple. I mean, there's a zillion... But, oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. So actually, you'd have to answer that uh, helpfully. It would be really good to go back to the 1960s, actually, because I think the last great cultural shock was the, the youth quake of the 1960s. Because if you look the at our church... The sexual revolution, you say? Yeah, sexual yeah. revolution was part of that. Rock and roll generation was part of that. Drugs, the whole hippie vibe was all a part of that. And a lot of that era actually started to reshape all the new social movements that then have affected our world so much to this day. Environmentalism, um, all the different uh, movements from the sexual revolution come from the 1960s. And when you look at the 1960s, the youth ministry that helped the church to adjust to that change was called the Jesus Movement. Because in the 1960s, um, the institutions of the church were finding it difficult to adjust to this changing culture where young yep. people were rejecting their values. And yet there were some young people in San Francisco in 1968, around that time, who started playing Christian rock and roll mm -hmm. and then starting Christian communes. Now, that only lasted as long as the hippie movement did. But after that hippie movement died out, the people who were part of those Jesus communes, like Christian surfers um, mm -hmm. um, and ones in Australia too, the leaders of those groups 
Uh, there was one called the House of the Gentle Bunyip in Sydney, the House of the Purple Door, some really creative names. <laughs> but the leaders of these movements go back into the institutional church and go into the youth departments of the institutionalised church. So that shock of the 60s was absorbed by the Jesus movement that then institutionalised their response. And that's where we get our youth services and our youth groups from. Would you say the revolution that's going on in the culture at the moment over homosexuality is of the same order of magnitude as some of these other ones you've talked about? I, I think it's always easier to look back and yeah. say yeah. What, what the big parts are. But coming back to the original question, when you said in the last 15 years, I think the fall of the Berlin Wall was a really big cultural change. Yeah. And I think something was happening in the culture around that time that made our youth group in the 80s not really relevant to the 90s. Really? And when our 90s youth group started emphasising relationships, it was a time when Nirvana released Nevermind and the, the whole culture swung from uh, you know hair metal and heavy rock that uh, celebrated excess to a more introverted style of music that was really capturing... Uh, the mood of the Gen Xs as, for example, they were the first generation to go through divorce on a large scale. Yeah. So people were really looking for reality. And then, interestingly, the fact that we were building a youth ministry model around relationships that were informed through the scripture, how we we're expressing the reality that Jesus has made us united, that was, I think, very appealing. If you fast forward, I think, to September 11, I think that was seismic. Yeah. But even more seismic for youth culture, I think, was 2008 with the iPhone. So when that came mm. along, I think that was another big shock in the road. So what I'm okay. looking for is uh, how you've, did we change our ripple, You've given me some ripples from Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. Give me some ripples from September 11, then give yep. me some ripples from the iPhone. Yeah. yeah. Again, I'm still researching I mean, this and thinking it, about it, it, but it feels like it's the the change from post modernity to post post modernity mm. from September 11. Mm. Is that what you would say? Or? I've read I've read about that. Yeah. yeah. But I also think if you look at the rise of the new atheists that came yep. out of September 11 and the the, I suppose, the more aggressive stance that atheists had yep. towards the church. I think that we're still living with the consequences of that, for example. Yep. Um, with the iPhone, I think uh, there are studies in the US that I've glanced at so far that talk about the fact that mental health issues amongst teenagers and young people have started to skyrocket since the, the iPhone was yep. invented. So I think these changes that we're talking about, the shock absorber model simply says, just like we did in the 90s as Soul Revival adjusted to the change, is it possible for a, a local youth ministry to be thinking about the changing culture they're in and communicate with the adults and vice versa and so that there can the be... the whole church get the through whole that, church can that, get that shock through absorber. Yeah. Because a shock absorber has two parts. The first part of the shock absorber is to absorb the shock, and I'm arguing that's the youth ministry, and then the shock of the cultural change gets absorbed more gradually into the rest of the church and that's the second action that a shock absorber does. So in our particular instance, uh, the way I'm approaching Soul Revival Church is that Soul Revival Youth Ministry discovered some principles and now we're trying to put that into practice in a whole church. Mm -hmm. So for Soul Revival, which is a ministry I'm part of, the first action of the shock absorber was to notice that the world was changing and continued to change. Mm -hmm. And then how do we then help the adult structures of church change as well? So we need to create places of conversation for that. I've heard you talk of third places mm -hmm. and been critical of some of the discussion around this whole third place area. Can you just kind of mm. wade into that for me? Yeah, that, that's really good. So Oldenburg uh, is the originator of the third place theory and it's a secular sociological theory. And all it really does is it looks at how do people gather in community in cities? So for, for people who are living in a big city, they don't often live and work and play in the same place. Going back to the village before the Industrial Revolution, people would live and work and play in the same village. So there was, there was a constancy of relationships. Mm -hmm. But Oldenburg quite helpfully works out that people in cities live in the first place, which is their home. Mm -hmm. They work in the second place, which is their workplace or their school. That could also be a second place. And then the third place is where they choose to go and have community. Now, some people have used that sociological theory and thought, oh, if we approach that with an incarnational driver, then what if we observe that the, the people that are not coming to church find the culture of the church increasingly different to what they're used to in their daily lives? 
So some people have used the third place to create a stepping stone between the church and the world, so to mm -hmm. speak. So it, it's not overtly Christian sometimes. I mean, it's got lots of expressions, but some of the third places that are driven by incarnationalism aren't, it, it, you know, that you wouldn't stand up and have a talk or mm -hmm. do a Bible study necessarily, although some do. But the incarnational drive is to create like a stepping stone in the church. I thought about that and using the atonement theory, I thought um, I already had a problem with how tired we were getting running church as an event. So we, we felt like we were going from weekend to weekend, another event to pull up another event. Mm. What third place excited me about was if church was a third place rather than an event, then we could approach church as a community and it would be, it would be a whole different paradigm. And so what we decided to do in the 90s was let's, instead of using third place as a stepping stone into the church, let's use an atonement based approach where the cross of Christ is going to be what we, what we um, articulate. And so let's gather around God's word, word in our service mm -hmm. and, and our gathering and then have third place community around that as mm -hmm. well. So in our church expression at Soul Revival on Saturday, which was our first uh, church plant back in 2012, we decided to have a one hour service where we'd, we'd sing and we'd pray and we'd read the Bible and we'd have some announcements and then we'd have a sermon and then we'd have another sing. And then after that, we would have a dinner together. So having a meal together at all our services has become a really important principle. And what that does is it gives us a third place that is defined by the gathering. Mm -hmm. So we meet together around God's word and then we spend time together putting it into practice mm. each week. How do you think through intergenerational cooperation in church? Yeah, That's been a really important one because, as we said earlier, the generation gap is getting more and more complex. Um, so rather than having church services at Soul Revival for different ages, we've decided to go for an all-age, all-stage approach. So all the church service was all the church services we run are for every generation. So that's that's the theory that we've put in place. And you're running the same music at each. So it's it's not yep. like some might do hymns at eight o'clock in the it's yep, kind of no. old school organ yeah. at eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and, no. Yeah, no. We all gather around, uh, and we. We, we'll sing some hymns sometimes. Mm -hmm. We'll sing some modern songs. We'll, now, now you're we, at church we'll plant, mm. so um, do you have? What's the average age? That kind of thing. Have you got some of those oldies there? Are they happy with you? Um, yeah, we ha we have we we don't have enough oldies in their eighties. We love some more oldies in their eighties. We've got um, um, every other decade represented mm -hmm. up until seventy. So, what's lovely at almost all our gatherings we have a cross section of ages between mm -hmm. you know going from children right up to people in their 60s and, mm -hmm. and 70s and how do you do the music is it are you particularly are you targeting a particular age group or demographic or are you what do you yeah. because music is such a big thing mm. in terms of defining mm. that it is isn't it well if if we put aside the need to be culturally relevant if we don't need to be culturally relevant then we don't need to actually so ukuleles? target it they have ukuleles Yep, I'm from the '90s, and, Bagpipes. and I like two forms of music, rock and roll. So, <laughs> so ukuleles are not my thing, but I appreciate the ukulele. <laughs> Bagpipes, we haven't had as yet. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're not doing that, are you? What's that? Ukuleles and bagpipes. <laughs> oh no, no, ukulele. they have had a, they have had the odd ukulele pulled out. Yeah, they've played ukuleles, and uh, well, it's, you know, some of the young hipsters play that kind of stuff. Okay. But not well, I mean, I'm, well, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the the instrument that is least culturally relevant to people around mm. you. Do you know? Mm. I mean, but I mean, to, you are thinking, or are you not, about the style of music that you're using in church? Yeah, I, I think I think the style question comes into it. It's just not the driver of what we do for the service, so it doesn't define the service. So if you look back to the 1950s... But, but yeah. okay, well, I'm going yeah. to have to dig you here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you define the musical style, you and the leadership, or does, is it somebody else who kind of... No, I'd say a music team that decided. Right, okay. Guided by you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking across the whole church that, um, that it's important that, that our music has good lyrics and that it teaches yep. people how to read the Bible and explains um, the Christian 
life and you know gets, mm-hmm. gives us an opportunity to do that other than that i i'm quite hands off when it comes to the music i'm quite happy for the music team to decide what sort of songs they what style of songs they want to use really mm. right okay well, I'll, I'll give you my theory and then you can yeah, critique it yeah go for it <laughs> um i've had the theory that churches are like radio stations that um and I, maybe i got it from rick warren i think i did that um uh, you tell me the songs they sing at your church and I'll tell you the kind of people who go to your church. Mm. Um, you think that... And so, um, therefore, I want to guide our music team uh, in the direction of uh, who I'm hoping, based on the census, census data, that I would like to come to our church. Um, so, uh, um, we don't sing... 17th century German ballads, do you know? Mm, because mm. We're, that's not our target group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we don't do that either. And right. we, don't, we don't sing polkas either. <laughs> polkas, <laughs> yeah. But it, it's not because... How can I explain it? It might I might be splitting straws or whatever the phrase yeah. is, but it, the driver is not getting a cultural impact, um, culturally relevant music. Yeah. The culturally relevant music comes from the people being just the people in that the culture they are. that they yeah. are. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. So the other thing we find is when when you have an all age all stage approach, there's a little bit of compromise that comes. Everyone yeah. compromises a little bit to love everyone yeah. else. So again, if the atonement's driving what we're doing, and we're other person centred, we're actually thinking of the other, not just thinking of ourselves and what we mm-hmm. we would like. And it's actually creates quite a warm atmosphere in church where. Christians aren't um, attempting to be culturally relevant first. They're actually attempting to be welcoming and f- not just being friendly, but being friends with people. Uh-huh. Now, in our youth ministry, 80% of the people who came along to our youth group were uh, people who made a decision for Christ. And it's not as high a percentage in our church, but yep. it's still 20 25% uh, unchurched and de-churched people that come along to Soul Revival. So when those people are... Um, growing as Christians and joining music teams and bringing their tastes to bear, then what tends to happen is we we get a mix of styles yep. of songs that some of them are a bit older, some of them are more modern. Yep. Uh, some of the young people give an older song a bit of a new twist. Some yep. of the older people give a new song a bit of an old twist sometimes. So mm-hmm. it's quite a creative okay. thing still. Let me run through some Facebook questions. Sounds good. Um, have you seen youth ministries work alongside, or how have you seen youth ministries work alongside parents well in caring for teenagers? Concrete ideas of things that can be done, whether by the ministry team, church leaders, or church as a whole. Yeah. Great. Again, using the theory of the third place, that's how you can bring youth and parents together in a non-threatening way, because food is a great thing to enjoy together, no matter how old you are. And so at each of our six gatherings, we have a meal. So on our Sunday gathering, we have breakfast and at our evening gatherings, we have a dinner. And so young people and older people tend to mix at those times and get to know each other. Uh, We actually, in our uh, church, we've got half the church is like a big cafeteria or a big coffee shop or um, with some lounges as well and the other half is the auditorium so we go into the auditorium to read the bible and then we come out to have dinner and in the cafeteria we have all these long tables so if you sit down with four people say four friends and you're all young adults or teenagers mm-hmm. let's say all four teenagers you're necessarily going to be sitting next to a family on one side and maybe yeah. some oldies on the other and yep. so you'll start to mix so having that third place around your gatherings is a concrete way of helping the generations to start a conversation Recommended resources for training youth leaders? Yes. Um, there are lots of them. I think I think YouthWorks does a great job in providing... Youth Works, Anglican YouthWorks yeah, Sydney. Yeah, Anglican YouthWorks in Sydney. They're terrific. They have a lot of really good resources. Um, what, what I might, might say is that, uh, that whatever youth resource you look at, think about what its theological driver is as you're reading it. Yep. Try and think, is that coming from a incarnational point of view or a, or a different point of view right. even an atonement one hey um i've noticed that your afternoon church services are afternoons rather than evenings yes. you've gone for kind of 4 mm. 35 mm. rather than 6 whereas mm. a generation ago all church services in the evening mm. were 6 p.m mm. um 
why have you done that mm. when actually aren't quite a lot of the people still at the beach? Some of them are still at the beach. And um, what we've done that for is so that we can have children at each of our gatherings. So again, like I said before, an all-age, all-stage church based on an atonement theology is going to be giving people an opportunity to make compromises so yep. that they can be together with a broader range of people. And so if it starts earlier and we have coffee before church and then we have kids teaching time and we have uh, a service and then the kids and the adults are all having uh, dinner together, then they're actually going to be able to do that. But if you you need to get your kids home early, you can go home, you can still early. home early. But if you yeah. want to stay late, you can stay late. Okay. So our young adults on a Saturday night, there's probably 70 of them that stay around on 70, on Saturday night, and they hang out sometimes till 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the oh, yeah. morning. So that's, that's an exception. There is something that goes on in the evenings. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. So, so the dinner, church doesn't stop when the dinner stops. We actually still hang out afterwards as well yeah. if we want to. Mm -hmm. Do you train high school students as ministry leaders um, for children, music, etc.? What advice do you have for inviting, training, growing them? Uh, that might be different from what they already get out of regular youth ministry? Yeah, we have a thing called the Light Leader Program. And what we do with the Light Leader Program is we give uh, Christian young people an opportunity to do a course that we've designed called the Commitments Discipleship Course, or uh, a, a discipleship course that helps them to work out what it is to be a committed Christian. And once they've done that, they can actually join a Light Leader Program where they can be a leader in one of the kids groups or in one of the other areas of church without the responsibility of leadership for short amounts of time and get special training. And what we find is by giving teenagers particularly an opportunity to be light leaders, they have a lot more um, training behind them when they, they actually become youth leaders mm -hmm. or kids leaders. Yeah. We could go on, but we've gone over time. Thanks so much for coming in, Stuart Crawshaw. Thank you for having me. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Stuart Crawshaw. And uh, Stuart, of course, um, uh, well, the senior pastor at Soul Revival Church in the Sutherland Shire in Sydney. He's doing a PhD uh, at the moment on youth ministry and those that whole area of uh, shock absorbers that he was uh, talking about. Uh, we hope you'll join us next week on The Pastor's Heart at this same time. 